There's also research that fisheries management impacts uh, directly to communities. Erin uh, Caruthers um, studied how shrimp allocation decisions in Newfoundland and Labrador um, impact onshore businesses and budgets budgets in municipalities. She was able to track all the benefits, the economic benefits of, of these allocations that were made with the community and with uh, the input of fish harvesters. Um, Kevin Squires and Melanie Weaver studied the snow crab allocation decisions in Nova Scotia, also where community was involved and fish harvesters were involved. And they were able to relate it to the impact it, it did on communities, like um, uh, improving the sustainability of communities and also of onshore uh, businesses. Uh, so we can see that policies do have an effect not only on the fisheries, on ecological, uh, on the ecolo uh, ecological aspects of the fishery, but also on communities. And there's risks to inter intergenerational equity and also to resilience of fisheries and coastal communities. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about different policies and programs that uh, happened in the fishery in the last three decades. First, there, there was the efforts to downsize the fishery through different buyout programs, early retirement, licensing changes. Um, I always show this figure because you can see uh, perfectly the number of licenses just going down rapidly, uh, starting in the late 90s due to all the policy changes. Um, before there were full full and part time uh, fish harvesters, and these these licenses were changed to core and non core. And for example, non core today, um, if people stop fishing, the license effectively stops or cease to exist. So nobody else can take it after that, um, cutting down the opportunities to work in the fishery. There's al there's also been efforts to maintain the few fish harvesters in the water or the few fishing enterprise in the water viable uh, through different policies. Um, the ones I like to focus on is the combination of licenses and the body up policy. Uh, the combination of licenses, basically if I'm a fish harvester, I can buy another license and then have a larger quota, but these two licenses become one. So when I uh, sell it, I can only sell it to one person and not to two people. And you can do this with two, with three, with four, et cetera, mm -hmm. through time. Um, the body of policy is two owner operators, that's people who fish their own license, um, to go in the same vessel and the same gear, instead of two, vessel, two vessels and two sets of gear, to fish for the same species. So this cuts down the opportunities for crew members to be hired to come into the vessel and fish. Um, there's been some research previously in change islands where body up systems actually um, cut down the opportunities for owner operators to share the same vessel. Before, there could be three or four fish harvesters going in the same vessel instead of two. So you have the two opposite um, aspects of the body up policy. There was a third big change, the professionalization system. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of it. There's three levels, the apprentice, level one, level two, and each level is linked to how many years you fish, full-time fishing. And full-time fishing means having 75% having of your income coming from fishing during the fishing season. That is from May to October. Before anyone could go fishing, um, uh, through, the, through survey findings, I found that uh, people learn how to fish through family members, through friends, not necessarily through through professional training. So the professional training in a way just helps people be certified to be able to fish. Actually level one, uh, you can be um, an operator, substitute operator and level two, you can own your own fishing enterprise. So this graph just shows that the effect that all these downsizing policies have had, the number of fish harvesters have has constantly gone down the number of women in the fishery has been constant, about 20, 22%, slightly increasing in the last years. It actually increased a lot in the late 90s because people, um, owner operators were taking their wives uh, to fish with them to offset the costs from, that, from the downsizing policies in the fishery. Um, so yes, yeah, so looking at this graph, uh, people are thinking, is there a labor shortage in the fishery? Are we having a problem? Are, are we not having, um, fish harvesters anymore. 
um, the Canadian Council of Professional Fish Harvesters um, commissioned a study of labor market in the fishery in in fisheries offshore and small scale across Canada, and in Newfoundland and Labrador, they found that. 35% of owner operators had difficulties recruiting crew, which is a high percentage. It's uh, one third. Um, talking with the certification board in the province, they say that new and the, the amount of new entrants per year is stable, but the problem is that these new entrants leave after 5 years and they don't come back. So the retention rate is only 20%. So this points out to some labor shortages in the future. So we wanted to look um, at the dynamics of how this recruitment and retention is going on. Uh, so our objective was to understand the underlying processes and dynamics and to look at policies and also think about policies that could help intergenerational equity in the long term. I use a mixed methods approach uh, to study issues of recruitment and retention. And uh, for those who don't know, it's just uh, combining quantitative analysis with qualitative analysis. For quantitative analysis, we launched a survey at the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. It was an online survey only for fish har harvesters. The certification board um, sent emails to everyone who's registered because we, we wanted to target those fish harvesters and nobody else through Facebook or someone who didn't have a registration. <laughs> In the survey, we ask things about what is needed to ensure the fishery for the future. What's what's your salary? Are you happy with your salary? Uh, what's the crew composition in your boat? Do you have problems recruiting or not? Um, we also conducted interviews. Interviews uh, because of the pandemic had to be um, conducted by phone. It was uh, very hard to obtain um, people who would participate. It was, I had to use recruitment um, techniques via social media, Facebook, Twitter. Um, we also used the FFAW magazine. Uh, it was very difficult to find people to talk to, uh, but we did a few. Uh, I also conducted a literature review and data collection from fisheries organizations. So just to give a quick overview of participants, uh, we conducted 11 interviews, uh, mostly men, mostly owner operators. We were lucky enough to talk to two people who want to enter fisheries work and are trying to do it um, and having trouble to enter. Um, for the survey, we had 330 participants, which is a good number. We also offered an incentive, so I think that's what helped. Um, the proportion here is uh, most most respondents were men. Uh, only 13% were women. Women are overrepresented in the crew members um, group, as it is in reality. Actually, there's very few women who are owner operators. Um, very few people were younger than 25. A lot of people were experienced fish harvesters. Uh, on average, they had been fishing for a living for 26 years, so they they know what they're talking about. Um, so I just wanted to present some of the findings from the survey of how recruitment looks like. I mentioned before that fisheries are embedded in the community, in families, in households. And uh, when we ask fish harvesters, I don't know if you can see well there, um, where do the crew on the vessel come from? Most people said they come from family members or family of the owner operator. Most people are local from the region and um, some people mentioned they have their spouse or wife working with them in the boat. Um, we also ask owner operators, how do they find crew to come and work with them? Actually, most of them said that they had had the same crew for years and in interviews, they said the same. They've never actually had to go and look for crew because they've been working with the same crew for many years. And if they have to look for a crew, they know who to hire because they know the people in the area, they know who's interested in fishing, who goes fishing one, um, once in a while. So it happens by word of mouth or through family members. Yes. Good question. Um, and the uh, just to be able to see us, uh, are they only in Newfoundland and Labrador, for example? Yes, yes. There, so the certification board, um, it's only part of Newfoundland and Labrador. There's 9,000 registered harvesters, and the 
the email was sent to about 5,000 of them who have email addresses and 330 were the only ones who participated. Okay, not from Nova Scotia. Not from Nova Scotia, only Newfoundland and Labrador because it, yeah, it, Nova Scotia doesn't have um, a registration system with the professionalization board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we ask, uh, we ask owner operators if they had problems recruiting crew and 80% said no. Um, 10% said some and 11% said yes. So this is significantly, significantly different from what the Canadian Council found. Um, this may be due because in 20, they did the study in 2015 and we did it in 2020, 2021. So it's been like five, six years where the outlook has changed a bit. Um, some stocks have, have increased, well, not, some quotas have increased, not stocks <laughs> maybe. Um, and there's been different allocation policies in the in the last six years. It could also be that the wording of the question was different. The their question was, um, have you had difficulties to find the experienced crew members to work on your vessel? So maybe that's the discrepancy. We don't know. Um, we also asked crew members, did you have problems finding a job as crew? As as you can see, eighty six percent said they didn't. So if you want to look for a job, you can find it. Um, I looked into the 14% that had some trouble and there's no differences in gender or years of experience for those who couldn't find a job. It just happened randomly. Um, now I'm gonna move on a little bit to what we found through speaking with fish harvesters on our interviews. We actually wanted to know, okay, if there's some kind of recruitment problem, how does it look like? What is the actual problem? Um, and we found that people don't have problem finding crew. There's a lot of crew out there. There's a lot of people who want to enter the fishery. Um, these are some quotes. I'm gonna read both of them. There's no trouble getting crew, no trouble with any of that stuff, but I can get a crew member anywhere, but getting a good crew that stays with you and you all work together, that's the hard thing. The second person said, you can get people anywhere now to go fishing. Everyone wants to go fishing. 10 years ago, you couldn't find a person if you're looking for them because the price was down. When the price is up, everyone wants to fish. So as you can see, everyone is out there willing to fish. Um, and price is, a, is one of the big um, characteristics. Well, it makes sense. You, you have to make ends meet. The second problem we found regarding recruitment is that actually some owner operators do need the help, the physical help to go out fishing, but they don't have enough money to pay for the salary. So this is the same problem at the end of the nineties. It continues to today. Um, some people told us we did have two workers for us, but financially so difficult to keep two people around all year round. Then the second person said, depending on the species, we usually need an extra worker or we might lay off a worker. So people, uh, especially older fish harvesters, need someone who's physical, physically fit for the crab pots or for, for uh, gear that is very heavy. And sometimes they need youth or people who are physically more fit than them to go out with them fishing, but they cannot pay for it. So they rely on family for that. Usually the sons and their sons. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna change gears and talk about professional, professionalization and training. It's, it's very conflicting because um, in the survey, we found that fish harvesters completely support training. Training provides a safer fishery, but they do not support the professionalization system per se. They think it's a difficult, um, it represents difficulties to move up the ladder. Um, so we found that, okay, the professionalization system in the nineties was created to remove, the, uh, to remove the moonlighters of the fishery. So those are part-time fisheries, uh, fishers. Um, they usually have a main job, a main seasonal job in the community, but in the summer they used to fish once in a while. So these were, were the part-time licenses that changed to non-core licenses. Um, the funny thing, or the curious thing, is that now the, um, the Canadian Council for Professional Fish Harvesters and also the Certification Board are motivating fish harvesters to um, 
engage in occupational pluralism. So also having other jobs besides the fishery. But in the 90s, this was created to take out the people who were involved in other jobs. Um, the fishery, the, the training improves the safety, as I mentioned before. And uh, it supports the owner opera operator and fleet separation policies, uh, which um, it's a policy that enables license holders to fish their own license, preventing that big companies have multiple are fishing multiple licenses at once. And the main obstacle on the professionalization system is that people cannot um, fulfill the 75% rule. So that means having 75% of your income from fishing during the fishing season. So this was the, the two phases of training or professionalization that we found during interviews. Um, here's a quote from another person. Uh, this, this is an owner operator. They say crew members cannot hold the certification because money is not there if you apply the 75% income rule. If the fishing season lasted from first fishing trip to last, then yes, it works. But I fish from late March to June, then boat is tied from June to October. The 75% rule is outdated as there are individual quotas now. So what we found is that some people catch their whole quota for the season in four or five trips, and then they have to tie the boat and they cannot make any more um, income from fishing during the fishing season, which is long. And if they have to abide by the 75% rule, it's difficult for them to have families, for example, for young crew members in their 30s or 40s. Um, in our survey, we also ask uh, fish harvesters, what do they think uh, they think they will be doing in five years? And there's a bunch of people who want to keep doing the same. They're very enthusiastic of doing, of keeping being crew members or, or owner operators. There's um, more crew members who would like to invest in a fishing enterprise. And there's also a significant amount of people who plan to retire, including crew members. Um, I don't have the figure here, but the age composition of crew members is actually pretty old, like in the older range. Um, even people who are apprentices, we found that people can, so there's the three levels in certification, apprentice level one, level two, there's people who stay as apprentices for 10 or 15 years fishing and they don't go up the ladder. So it's a, it's a bit concerning if plans for the future are to retire and there's no new people coming in. So one of the, the main concerns of people is where are these licenses going to end up? Because when we make them more viable, they're more costly. So how can crew members who have unstable employment and low wages can afford them? Who will be able to afford them? And it's um, like this quote said, it's a community problem. Um, people who want to stop fishing basically are selling their enterprises to existing fishermen, to existing core harvesters who are doubling up or tripling up their quotas. So what I see is the wealth of the sea being concentrated in a relatively fewer and fewer and a fewer hands and the community is dying. Um, so is there actually a recruitment problem? I would say there's actually a big, huge gap between crew members and owner operators, even if crew members are from fishing families. Um, the unstable conditions, uh, Working conditions and employment conditions um, affect both owner operators and crew members, but crew members are in a lower category because they depend from employment of owner operators. So if owner operators themselves cannot remain stable, it's difficult for them to provide good jobs for crew. And if they don't have good jobs, they cannot um, save enough money to buy an enterprise. So yes, so this has to go hand in hand with increasing the viability of the insiders creates a push towards new entrants. And there's also pooling effects of other industries, for example, the oil and gas industry or mobile workers who go to Alberta and can, can make a, a better wages um, there than in, the, uh, in fishing in, in coastal communities. Um, Yes, so I mentioned that uh, fish harvesters from fishing families also have problems um, 
and to in fisheries work because of the 75% rule. They feel that it's unfair. They feel that they cannot have a family, a house, um, if they have to, to maintain these requirements in order to be able for them uh, to be able to have the fishing enterprise of their parents. And then I found it very interesting that both crew and owner operators were very satisfied with their wages, even though there's significant uh, differences in wages, as you can see here. I don't know if this the people in the room. Uh, so, as, as expected, crew members make much less than owner operators. So, as conclusions for our study, and I'm happy to talk more in the discussion about our interviews and the rest of the data. I'm not presenting a lot of the data because there's many stories to tell. Uh, but the main story is that there's a looming crisis on intergenerational equity in terms of succession in the fishery that intensifies with the imminent aging of the workforce in the fishery. Um, the recruitment problem is not a recruitment problem that is immediate per se, but it's the problem from becoming an owner operator if you're a crew or if you're a new entrant to establish yourself as crew and make a viable livelihood just by being crew in the fishery. There's also policies and regulations that support the insiders, but create a wall for the outsiders. And there's no policies that support the new entrants. Um, there's efforts to improve the fishery, yes, but there's not, these policies have been there since the since two decades. So they have created consequences, unintended consequences for two decades. So it has implications in terms of recruitment and retention of people in communities as well. Small scale fisheries in Newfoundland and Labrador happen in very rural and isolated places, making it very difficult to make a livelihood of anything else. Uh, so fisheries, it, it could be thought of, um, of a strategy to keep people in their communities and make them more vital um, to increase the vitality of the, of the communities. Then there's a question, who will keep the licenses? Who will be able to afford them? And what are the policies or regulations that directly impact recruitment and retention? Who, who is making them or who's fighting uh, for them? Um, and I added this, this graph because we ask fish harvesters how important uh, were the following in choosing to become a fish harvester. And you can see that the most important one is like, Fishing meant I could stay in the community. So people want to stay in the community. They want to fish, but there's all these obstacles um, related to working in the fishery. So, yes, so I want to thank all of the people who helped me. Um, there's people from DFO, from Tromso, and from the certification board, as well as Rick Williams, who was the person who did the study for the Canadian Council of Professional Fish Harvesters. And we talked a lot about the differences in our studies. And yes, I'm happy to listen. There we go. Hopefully that's not echoing too bad for everybody online. We have the, so we're gonna take questions here. Um, I'm gonna turn the speaker on for you so we can hear everybody online. If anybody online has questions. Um, actually, yeah, let's just do that first. Does anybody online have questions? Anybody in the audience? Paul. Of all the respondents that responded to the survey, have a sense for their geographic perspective. They didn't say guns, mm -hmm. but actually fish out of the world. St. John's. Yeah. Um, so they're not really living. <laughs> so folks don't. Uh, yeah. So I guess my first question is, do you see spatial variation? Do we sort of change the question to them? Yes, so I had uh, so I had two questions. Where are you from? Where do you reside? And where do you fish? To so see those things. And most of them do fish very close to where they reside. I would say almost everybody. I had so much trouble trying to do a map because they're all over. People are all over the island. I didn't 
I didn't have responses concentrated. So they were you widely that's spread. Pretty homogeneous. Like an answer from Labrador might look like an answer from the Northeast Coast. Maybe. So yeah, I have to say that we didn't launch the survey in Labrador uh, because we didn't have ethics approval. Um, there's indigenous communities who participate in the fishery, so we didn't have ethics approval to to cover that area. Maybe on the island, then would, it, would, it, would respondents on the west coast look a lot like respondents on the northeast coast? I think that's a great question, and that's something that I should look into because I didn't. Yeah, no, that's a great question. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, okay, last question. Do you want to go back to your last slide? Uh, yeah. So I'm trying to interpret that. I mean, I, I like. I'm a bit surprised by the reserve in a sense, but then I'm putting that in the context of the age distribution of the respondents. Yeah. And so, meaning about half of them were 45 years old or older, something like 45 years old. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that makes sense that people that started fishing 20, 30 years ago did that to stand the community. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that will be different by 25 years ago, basically. Mm -hmm. Whether the job opportunity or the opportunity to make money is more important than asking. Yeah. I'm trying to think of that. In life. So I don't know if maybe you don't have the data. I'm just, yeah. That's my interpretation of that. Right here. I do have the data because I could have uh, segregated by age these responses, and it would be very interesting to have a cutoff. I had very few people under 25, as yeah. you saw. Um, I don't have, I think I have. This is a, I don't have the age um, graph, but this is a graph with crew members only. So 160 people in each level and their age groups. And you can see that there's a lot of apprentices who are over 54 years of age. And there's this chunk of 35 and 44. That's important, I think, uh, in the apprentice group. And then it's important in level in level one and level two. I think the ones that are important, yeah, the 35 and and well, the 45 and 54, the next group over. But that's a that's a good question to to segregate these responses by age groups. Have a cutoff group, 40, yeah. under 40, above 40. Exactly. I can speak about research done by Nicole Power on youth. She looked into youth from 16 to early 20s. And there's a lot of people who said, well, we are taught that we need to leave the community. And it's actually a common topic in islandness studies. Like you learn to leave, you know, you're going to leave. Um, but that doesn't mean that people want to leave. It's just that people are conditioned. They are, that's what they see as a success instead of staying. Um, so it has to, to do a little bit with the image of, of rurality. What's the image that rurality is it really. What is valuable? I mean, I thought. The pandemic was interesting because a lot of people in the news, they said that a lot of people came back. So what is it that rural New Finland has to offer? There is one question online by Mike Kehoe. Uh, just a second, Mike, let me get to it. Oh, they didn't. So the other question I had is, um, so lots of people are buying the enterprise of repairing. And I mean, uh, <laughs> I've seen that a lot on the West Coast, on the lobster fishing, that's not anyone. There are limit, like there are a cap on the number of enterprise you can buy, or the number of, basically the number of license you can buy, let's say for lobster or for the park. Not that I know. I mean, there's a DFO licensing person on the public, that would be great. <laughs> if there's a limit on the amount of licenses that you can buy, I don't know. You do have to be certified, a certified fish harvester to get these licenses. So you have to fish your own license. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the controlling agreements, uh, processing plants. Um, in the past, they were giving loans to fish harvesters to be able to afford their license on their boat and gear. 
but then basically it was the processing plant who managed uh, the benefits from that license. So the professionalization system uh, came to be just to avoid these control agreements, because if, if you're a processing plant and you don't have a certification to fish, then you cannot go fishing for that license. Um, if you read the navigator or listen to the fisheries broadcast, you would hear people say, well, people have the license under someone in the under the name of someone in the community, but it's actually the processing plant behind it. We cannot prove that. We don't know what's going on. Um, in that yeah. sense, so outside of the processing plants, we are just talking about professional fishermen. You have that growth of the risk of, of um, how do you call that? You know, when all the license is being owned by just a few person, I think mm -hmm. it's like to think of that in the context of. I know, I mean, the two most valuable fishery would be uh, lobster and crab. The price of license is going up crazy, so you have everybody that can afford to buy the license. Yeah. Every one is going to be a very successful fishery. Exactly. So how does that play into? How does that fit with that? Apprentice staying too long, apprentice and so on. And you're going to so that, yeah. So yeah, so that's that's the crisis of recruitment, right? Because all these policies that were that initiated in the late nineties kind of supported the f the few fish harvesters that stayed. So these enterprises are worth way more money now. The problem is that crew are have unstable jobs, and they're the ones who can fish those enterprises, but they cannot afford them. They're more viable. But the next people in line cannot afford them. So these are the questions like where where are these licenses going to end up? Um, there's other efforts, for example, in Norway, where fishing enterprises also are worth a lot, but the government has a special loans for young people, or they have a special licenses that are temporary for 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 younger people. And once they have made enough investments, they they pass the license to another young person and they can afford the fishing enterprise of the older person. So these are the policies that Newfoundland and Labrador, I don't think has committed to yet. They have thought about it. I think there's a lot of talk, but they haven't committed to them. Okay, um, we'll have Mike here. Hi, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It's very uh, interesting and to the people. Just a second, man. We can't hear you yet. Don't work there. Let me see. I'm, uh, I'm okay on this side. I think it's plugged in. Yep, we're Maybe I'm good he here. Can type it? Uh, mm -mm. <laughs> it's just a random cable. That's unpromising. <laughs> oh, we're, uh, let me try it here. One moment now. Let me see. Can you watch? Are you able? Are you able? Are you able to hear me there now? Hi. Are you able to hear? Hold on. There we go. How's that? We good? Yeah. There we go. We got it. Okay. Good. Well, first of all, thank you for a very interesting presentation, and to the organizers for putting it off. Um, uh, I'm not active as a farmer, as a harvester today in the industry, but I've had many years in the fishing industry, and uh, most of them at the management level. I'm a former director uh, with the provincial department of fisheries and a marketing manager for some international companies as well in marketing and product development. I guess uh, I didn't see. I may have missed it. That was a few minutes late to your presentation. Um, I didn't see any discussion by you of the role of the provincial. Department of Fisheries in this problem where our where our harvesters are aging, where in the 90s, uh, Desmond Braw and the FFAW put into place the Professional Fish Harvester Certification Board, which in effect um, restricted entrances to the industry and indeed puts them out. But now we have a situation where license values are shooting to the roof 
nobody can afford to purchase them in the community level. They're being purchased by large offshore entities. And then when the entities are ready, they'll shut down processing facilities and move these uh, to offshore trawlers to be shipped out to, to, cheap, to cheap countries. So it's a very dark cloud over the industry based on what you've said here today because of lack of access to licenses. This is true in every industry, whether you own a taxi business, you want to own, own all of the licenses, whatever you do, the same thing. So you didn't really speak about other than professional fish harvesters, which is really an entity all into itself, controlled by the FFAW on its board, and everything it does is controlled by the harvesters and professionalization. What role did you reach out to the province on this and say, you know what, it's the coastal villages. Yes, the federal government controls quotas, but our people live in our coastal communities. What role, what does the government actually do? Okay, thank you. I'm gonna mute myself and have you unmute yourself. So I, I couldn't hear very well. Um, because the sound is not great, but if I understand, you were asking about what the provincial government has done with respect to the problem of recruitment of people in the fisheries. Yeah, so there's different yes. actors. Um, there's the Department of Fisheries um, and Oceans Canada, but there's also FFAW, you're right. Um, they do advocate for fish harvesters and for processing workers. Um, some people in our interviews mentioned that, well, the FFAW might be, I don't want to say, well, perpetuating the problem of recruitment of crew members because they advocate for the interest of the insiders in the fishery, but not the outsiders of the fishery. This is not completely true because FFAW does target new entrants and youth, but there's some people who have the vision that if you make the fishery more viable, it won't be affordable for people outside of the fishery and who is the union actually supporting? Is it supporting only the people who want to make more, more money in the fishery who are already inside the fishery or also the people who are not able to enter the fishery? And we can also talk about problems of fairness of who can enter fisheries work because if, if you think about it, people have been passing on their licenses within the family. So the, in those families where there's no not a fishing license, then there's all these discrepancies between your neighbor and you. And then we can go on into another into other groups, into racialized groups, into immigrants, into women not being able to enter fisheries work as it becomes more and more constrained. I don't know of any efforts from the province uh, per se on the fisheries, as it seems the fisheries management is uh, done at the federal level. But there's also community level organizations who are advocating for for more access to the fishery. And I hope that answers partially uh, your question. All right. Um, are there any more questions or no? <laughs> Provinces where cluster has been booming massively, yet lately and the price has been so good, and we see quite good. Mm -hmm. And I, so I was wondering why not the fishery that you're doing pretty well in some some fishing, right? I mean, the price of the double down high, of the same, but the volume is good. I wonder if do you see difference in desire from the young to come into fishing nowadays, let's say the last five years, 10 years, than we will see 95 in other regulars. Yeah. And can you try this kind of temporal differences in yeah. desire to work with fish? I think, so, yes, I, I, this comes to, I'm going to repeat the question. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, yes, so your question is, can you track if younger people are increasingly more interested in the fishery because there's a lucrative business from it. I know their province is the lobster fishery. I know a bit from the Magdalen Islands that there's a younger people coming into lobster and earning a lot of money. 
uh, you can track that. And I think this has to do with your previous question, um, doing the analysis segregated by age to see at the, at the um, different interests between age groups. Um, the Canadian Council of Professional Fish Harvesters also didn't segregate by age, but this is something that we could do. They did a survey with similar questions. We made a survey. If this survey could continue every two or three years, it was very easy and cheap to do it. Uh, why not keep doing it? I think we should do also a survey with people who are outside the fishery, like people who come to the Marine Institute, who take courses at the Marine Institute, um, students at MON, people in communities, what are their interests? Where do they want to go? I'm involved in another study looking at sustainable employment in aquaculture in the Bering Peninsula, and it's interesting as I was mentioning before, what young people or youth want or what do what they see as uh, success. You can also think of that not only in age, but in time, right? So, for example, mm -hmm. 40 years old, you may, you may be more interested to join the fishery nowadays than it was in, in 2000 yeah. or in 95. Yeah. Just because, it, I mean, the dynamic in terms of price and, and you know, money they make per entry, like, still how many it was 25 years ago. I, and for that, you need a longitudinal yeah. analysis, like several surveys. Um, and I would say, given the professionalization system, you need someone who has been fishing for a while if they want to enter fisheries work. Uh, most people, we ask people, what do you look for when you seek for crew? And most owner operators didn't actually mention training. They actually mentioned experience and willing to learn, willing to be there. So I have a question. Yes. <laughs> um, so um, did you? I don't know. I don't think you touched on this, but what other aspects um, are are affecting um, kind of the uh, when you not not the recruitment, but the maintaining of a worker um, in terms of like their their work health? So maybe. Um, so, so maybe having, having internet access, access you know, you know, how important is that to maybe if you ask these people like, like having, having internet access, 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 you know, so they can keep in touch with their families or something, something, like, something like that. Is that, is that really, really affecting like, retention of, of workers or attractiveness to the fisheries at all? Yeah, and especially with smaller boats, boats, the bigger boats are going to have satellites and, and TVs and gaming consoles chef but not the smaller enterprises don't really have that kind of stuff so, so is that, is that, that you look at? uh during interviews i i i wouldn't say we looked at it in service just by interviews talking informally with fish harvesters and looking at the navigator <laughs> i think um there's uh people who enter fisheries work or who are just a tiny little bit interested in fishery they love the water they, that's their life. They really want to go. I've also heard of cases where people, uh, their family has been fishing for years, for decades, and they are expected to join the fishery. And when they join, they're actually scared to go out fishing. That's not what they are. So there, there's a societal um, approach, but there's also the, the, the fact that some people just grew, grew up close to the water, grew up uh, listening about fishery fishing or the fishery, um, a lot of people who experience firsthand the, the cod moratorium and the subsequent moratoria. Um, I don't look per se about occupational health and safety or communication as something that may impact retention, but I know that people who are very motivated to go in, they have these, these links and ties, family ties and friend, friendship ties as well. Uh, and um, so do you also look at, uh, I'm actually not 100% sure, I come from Washington State, where's commercial fishing, and there's no setup of health care or, or retirement, and there's no safety if you if you break your thumb, you know, you, you put a splint on it and you go back to work, hopefully. Um, so is that kind of something that scares people off, or is there a safety net in Canada for that, because I'm not really aware of that. So that's one of the things we ask in the survey. Um, injury, uh, COVID problems, and how it affected their fishing or wanting to fish. 
And they said, no, they had no trouble about getting injured. I know that in Canada, it's a, it's an op a public health system. I know there's research on workers compensation and having difficulties to get workers compensation when you get injured at work. There's been safety issues in the sense that um, the season is open just a certain amount of time. And if you get injured, you have to go fishing anyways, because if not, you don't make enough money to be able to, to earn your 75% uh, from the fishing or to make enough money to get employment insurance for the winter. Uh, so these are the issues that people um, hide, but if they wanted to obtain uh, health care, they could. And um, last is kind of just overall, I I'm not sure if I caught this or if I should just already know, but how does this data, um, this information, this research actually get utilized? Do you just go outside the DFO or, you know, and protest or, or like, is there a formal, like, I'm going to go to this meeting and yeah. present my research <laughs> and hopefully they listen to me or do you, is there any poll? Like what, what is the next steps after yeah, this? It's a great question. So yes, uh, before initiating the survey, I did a lot of pilots with the survey uh, with FFAW and the Professional Fish Harvest Harvester Certification Board. So we worked closely together. We sat down, we looked at every question, every response. Um, we called fish harvesters um, and ask them the questions um, by phone to see if they understood. Um, so there's a lot of links that we have with these organizations and we're gonna produce a lay language report that we aim to, to give to the certification board, FFAW, DFO, if they wanted to. Um, and then we have a conference that's called Getting It Right Conference in June, 2022 um, from Too Big to Ignore um, and also from OFI. And this conference, we are inviting fish harvesters, uh, community members, not only academics, and we are going to sit down and talk, present our results and get feedback. So it would be a, an iterative process where, where we are also presenting, for example, one of the results I get that people have conflicting views from the professionalization system. So some people defend it a lot, some people are against it. So sitting down with people who actually benefit or not from the certification board. It's very useful for us to understand how complex it is. Um, so yeah, so those are the efforts we're doing to communicate back. Great, so thank you. Um, do we have any more questions? We still have six minutes, so. All right, well, I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, so thank you for the talk today, Dr. Gomez. <laughs> Uh, before I end it, I would like to introduce next week's seminar. Dr. Mike Allen will be joining us via WebEx from his warm, sunny location of Florida. Dr. Allen was actually my fish population dynamics professor at the University of Florida. So I can tell everyone here, if you want to hear a thick Southern accent teach you about population dynamics, you should join on the meeting. Uh, the title of his talk is Exploring Impacts of a Common Snook Expansion into North Florida with Implications for Estuarine Food Webs. And uh, everyone is welcome to turn up their heaters and put on some sandals and pretend they're in Florida with us in the meeting. Um, thank you for everyone for joining us today. Have a great Wednesday and don't forget to get your storm chips and beverages today. All right.